and welcome to a brand new episode of Talking Law from Women in the Law UK. I'm Sally Penny, a barrister based in Manchester at Kenworthy's Chambers and a joint vice chair of the Association of Women Barristers. I'm also the founder of Women in the Law UK, an organisation which is passionate about supporting the next leaders in law. We put on regular events, host masterclasses and also enjoy an annual dinner and conference. Do come and learn more about what we do at womeninthelawuk.com. You could also connect with us on social media. We'd love to hear from you. You can find us on LinkedIn. Just search for Women in the Law UK. On this episode, I'm thrilled to be talking to Kevin Withane. Kevin qualified as a lawyer in the UK, but has worked all over the world and is currently the Group Ethics and Compliance Director for TI Fluid Systems in Michigan in the USA. Kevin specializes in international law and corporate governance and also provides consulting to companies on diversity and inclusion. I asked Kevin how a British lawyer ended up living in America. It's a very long, circuitous route. I'm an Enfield boy from North London, but I've spent the best part of the last 15 years in China, in Hong Kong, in Russia, back to the UK. China, Hong Kong, and now the US. With my current company, TI Fluid Systems, um, I started 10 years ago in Oxford. And then after a few years, they moved me to Shanghai. I set up the department there, and then I wanted to go to Hong Kong, so we moved to Hong Kong. And then a few years later, three years ago, almost to the day, I moved to Michigan. And I've been here now for better or worse. It's a It's a different experience. We speak the same language here, but very different culturally. So I'm still learning about American culture. Yes. Why did you go into law in the first place? I wondered if you had family members or anything. I think because I think you trained to go to the bar, didn't you, originally? I did, yeah. So um, I guess I was probably about 13 or 14. And you know, when you sneak down the stairs as as a kid, you're supposed to be up in your room and you're looking through the, the railings and the bars and looking at your what your parents were watching it was LA Law and you can sit there quietly watch the episode and then shoot back up well that's what pretty much what I did and it looked glamorous yeah and then you know Ali McBill which was quirky but it was cool you can never really say that in an interview particularly when you're starting off but that is the truth of it and then I started to read about Rumpole and like you would see Kavanaugh QC and programs like that and it was like inspiring I was like I'd, I'd like to do this mm. but I'd never wanted to strangely do family or criminal and I think family because I come from a a family which was, uh, you know, um, my parents separated and, you know, had to do that. So it's it's something that I felt I just didn't have the stomach for. Um, And criminal, I always felt I personally, I don't want to mess up. And then it's somebody else's life that I've impacted. uh, And I just know that uh, it was too much of a burden. I felt that I, I don't know if I could do it. I think you have to be a very, very special person to do that. Yes. Um, I'm not sure about special. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's interesting. And so for you, why did you try to become a, a solicitor rather than barrister? I actually did the BBC after university. Um, so I finished my degree and then took a year out and then travelled around the world, mm-hmm. came back, did the bar BBC, mainly because I was told, well, bar is more intellectually challenging than the LPC. So and more vocational so I wanted to do that and then actually I applied for pupillages and I struggled with it and this was I remember being told by one of my friends oh you know the interviews you're getting you know you're the token they have to meet certain criteria according to the bar council in terms of diversity or in diversity of candidates yes. so you're the token and I was like no I'm not no I'm not I can do this but I didn't get the opportunity so then I actually went in-house I uh, worked for a charity, the Quango, and then I moved to China in 2005. And that's the first time I went into a uh, law firm with Simmons and & Simmons. And it's from there then I decided, you know what, I can dual qualify. And so that's what I did. I think at Simmons, they loved it in China because it was an American partner there. And he was like, oh, we've got a barrister from England. <laughs> and then when I moved to Russia with Chad Ball and Park, I used to have these lengthy conversations with a uh, 
one of the senior partners in the Moscow office because he loved, um, he was a litigation partner and he just loved our legal system, but also the advocacy and and being a barrister. And I used to say to him, you know, I actually haven't practiced in court. And he's like, yeah, but but you've, you've learned about it. Let's just talk. So we used to spend hours just chatting, which was great. Yeah. Kevin, I, I wonder if we can, I'm going to talk in a moment about what it's like being counsel in in a PL, in a, such a large PLC with such a high turnover. But can I ask you before that really about, you know, a time that meant the most to you or a time in your professional career or a case that meant the most to you, which you might call made you? Yeah, couple of things but more recently I think it's my movement towards ethics and compliance and taking on that responsibility because it's an area that I wanted to focus on and I had I've been exposed in doing ex- investigations and things like that but we didn't really have any ethics and compliance function it was you know a bit of a mixed match yes. um, particularly sort of run out of internal audit I didn't think that was the right approach I think we needed to be a slightly different approach, more consistent with what other companies are doing. And then we had in 2017 a whistleblower related to issues in China and actually a colleague that I really valued and the friendship and, you know, have to go and then investigate. And I remember I really didn't want to go because then I read the claim and I was like, ah, this doesn't seem real, but we talked over it with my boss who's the chief legal, chief legal officer and also the chief HR officer. And I remember it was on a Friday and they came out and said, you're going to have to go. And on a Sunday, when I was supposed to be landing in China, was my wife's birthday. Oh. And pretty much every birthday that she had had since we got together, and that hadn't been that long, I'd missed. And so it was like another work trip on your birthday and unplanned as well. And also shortly after we'd moved to America. So anyway, went out there, did a pretty intensive few days of investigating, came back, reported, and was like, I think there's an issue we might need to do something. So then it just sort of waterfalled into lots of actions, a bit more in-depth investigation going back out in January and really spending four weeks of intensive investigations and follow-ups and things like that. And then I think that really catapulted me because I had much more visibility with the CEO, CFO, and that, you know, directly asked me what my thoughts were on the issues. And then from that, it's how we then started looking at, well, what, actually, what are we doing? Why why did we have these issues? And it's questions I started raising. It's like, maybe the way of telling people, don't do this, you could go to jail, isn't working. We need to re-educate in a different manner. We need to tell them, this is why you should do this. This is why we have these policies in place. This is why it's important. Yeah. And so really, that's given me the opportunity to, to take on that responsibility at, at TI. And it's actually one I I spend a lot of time on and I really enjoy and I think I think we're moving in the right direction now which is good. Yes so what, what advice would you give to somebody who wanted to become a general counsel or company solicitor? I think you need a much more diverse set of skills than certainly in private practice. In private practice your colleagues are all the other lawyers Yes. whereas in-house you have a few lawyer colleagues if you're fortunate enough to even be in a department with more than one lawyer but the, your colleagues who would be essentially your clients they have completely diverse backgrounds completely different expectations both of what you should be doing what you think you should be doing and what they want and it's trying to match up those I'd say you need to have financial skills You've got to understand how to read a, a balance sheet um, that's critical You've got to have really good people skills and you can't sit on the fence because there is no, you know, one of the things that used to frustrate me with private practice was you caveat every piece of advice so that, you know, as a, you know, cause I get it cause you don't want to get sued on your insurance, but yeah. in house you don't have that luxury. It's a, uh, if you don't know the answer, it's I'll come back with the answer, but there is no, well, you can do this or you can do that. It's here are your options. This is what I recommend. That's what people want. If, if you don't do that, if you're the guy who just, yeah, answer questions with questions and that sort of thing, you're not going to get on. And eventually you, you won't succeed. And also, I think you've got to take, I'm a lawyer, that out of you. And it's, I'm a business person, just like you. How are we going to get this done? Yeah. So essentially, you need more business skills as well as the legal skills. Yeah. And it's the skills, actually. Sadly, law firms, 
law firms don't really develop in their lawyers, which, you know, when you fake, you look at these law firms, they are, they're businesses for all intents and purposes. Um, and you look at law schools, they don't do enough to develop these skills. These are, these are soft skills, but I think they're so, so critical. Kevin, um, you read a lot of thought leadership books uh, and you follow a lot of leaders. Indeed, mm-hmm. you, you gave a, a webinar to Women in the Law UK during our lockdown. Uh, and I wonder, really, you know, who are your inspirational leaders in business or, or, or law or otherwise? OK, I think... The business leader and the book that's had the most, I'd say, transformative and profound effect on me is by a guy called Bob Chapman. He is the CEO of a company called Barry Waymiller, and he wrote a book called Everybody Matters. And it is his story about his leadership and, and, and the changes he made and what he did with that company. And that was a company that was struggling. And, you know, it's also a company that in, in the 2008-9 Great Financial Recession, did not lay off a person wow which is amazing and you know i'm thinking about you know even i was i was laid off from chadbourne and park actually uh, in that financial crisis that's an amazing story but it's how he did it and it was really, ultimately it's about putting people at the heart of your decisions it's treating them like they're members of your family so what would you do if your family it's it's about sharing successes and 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 everybody's successes and and allowing people to grow and develop as leaders. So I think that is the business leader and his book is brilliant, but also that sort of changed me and my style. And I reflect on that a lot as if I'd done this before, you know, my decisions would actually have been very different. And, and you know, I, I, I had a, a, a colleague, I brought her on in Hong Kong. She, she handed a notice in, in June around this time, actually 2018. I was a little bit taken back, but at the same time I was like, do you know what? it's probably the right decision because I'm not sure if she's right for the role. And I think she had some personal issues and I wasn't equipped to deal with that. I didn't know what I was doing. And also my style of leadership was, I don't think I listened enough. And I always believe that people leave managers or leaders and they don't leave companies because it's your manager and leader that sets the tone and everything else. And so I reflect on that thinking, and maybe if I'd done things differently over a prolonged period, she may still be here and she may have developed to the to, to a really good lawyer. I think she could have been. I don't want to make those mistakes again. So I reflect on that regularly so that with my current team, I, I don't do that. And now it's got into the process now of um, I send them a thank you every Friday with a, a very specific why I'm grateful for you in my life. And so I do it every Friday. It's week 22 now. So I, I used to write it just to myself in my journal. Yes. And I was like, why am I not telling them? That's, and, I, and it was I'm oh, maybe a little bit embarrassed to do it because it's a bit cheesy, but I actually think it it makes me feel good every Friday, that's for sure. Yeah. And, I, and hopefully I think it makes them feel engaged and valued. What a great idea. Yeah. One more book I'd recommend is there's a guy, it's very um, sort of a bit cultish, uh, is Kazu or Kazu Inamori. The book is called A Passion for Success. And it's really split up into little chapters. And it's sort of the same theme with, about human leadership, but it's about putting people first. And he was doing it from the, I think, the 70s with a company, which is a multi-billion dollar company now. It's Japanese, Kyocera. It's a great book. It's so small, simple, and easy. You, you literally, you know, like when you're a kid and you highlight everything? Yeah. That's pretty much what you'll do with that book because every word is like a piece of wisdom. I'm going to order it. Um, so, Kevin, you, you know, you're very much into being a leader as well as being a lawyer and so I want to ask you please this you know what sort of leader would you like to be I notice you're starting your own podcast and interviewing thought leaders if you like can you tell us a bit about that how did that come about and so what sort of leader would you like to be okay I guess to use the words from Bob Chapman be the leader that you want to lead you so I want someone who cares who puts my interests and my well-being because the way I feel engaged is if if you're taking interest in my work, if you're setting the expectations, you are challenging me. I don't want an easy job. I want to be challenged. I want to go to work and develop. I don't want work to impact my home life either um, because I spend, you know, a huge amount of time with work. I don't want to take that home and have that affect my family. So it's taking all of those things into consideration. That's the sort of leader I want to be. So I want to put people first. Um, and as a lawyer, 
that's not what you know sometimes that's hard we tend to be people who execute orders and so sometimes you know it is part of the job and and it's what we've got to do but going back to when I very first started out and I was in-house when I started out at um, the Royal National Institute for Deaf People uh, it's actually something that's been around for a long time is lawyers are the conscience of the company People joke when I say that because they always, you know, all the lawyer jokes are very negative about yeah, yeah, uh, lawyers' yeah. integrity and, and things like that, which is always really funny that lawyers are, tend to be the bastions of compliance and ethics. Yes. Um, but it, it's it's really going back to the heart of that is like it's doing the right thing even when people are not looking. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Absolute, absolutely. Wow. I, I wonder then, what do you think about diversity in the legal profession? Um, I'm a black woman practicing law. I have been doing for 20 years now. What do you think when you look at it? Is it different in the employed sector as opposed to private sector? But what, what are your views on diversity and certainly gender, race and social mobility? So I've had the privilege of working in a host of different countries. So I've, I've got the privilege of, of seeing it develop. I think certainly the in-house sector is one that's growing, growing in, I think, in the value that lawyers see of being an in-house lawyer. I think it used to be, oh, if you're an in-house lawyer, then you're, you're just not cut out for private practice. You're not good enough to be a private practice lawyer. And I'm talking at the sort of mid, like the silver circle, magic circle, the top 100, 200 firms. Yeah. You're, oh, you're not good enough for that. And Which is nonsense. Which is nonsense. I think actually you have to develop a host more skills to really be successful in-house. But also the role has very much changed from in-house now. You are a business player, you work with everybody. But I think in terms of diversity, things are better, but they're far from, far, far, far from anywhere close to being acceptable. And I had a conversation with a, a senior chief legal officer and he, and he said to me, oh, Kevin, what are you talking about? Our profession is one of the best professions to be in for diversity. I was like, are you absolutely joking? Do you not read anything? Because literally weeks ago, the Law Society in the UK is saying we are one of the worst professions for <laughs> diversity. And I was like, and it, the thing is, it's not the lack of uh, entry level. No. And that's purely on gender as opposed to race. I think race is a slightly different aspect of it. But just going on purely gender diversity, at the entry level, you are getting equal or more number of women coming into the profession. Yes, I think it's about 52%. Yeah. Problem is, and I actually saw this firsthand when I was in private practice, yeah, there were a number of, at the junior ranks, women lawyers, particularly in trainees. But you look up the the ranks and the level of seniority and it, and it peters out and it tends to be some of the women, if they end up having families, either they want to come back but the work environment, oh, you need to be in the office. You need to be pushing 70 hours a week, 100 hours a week. You need to hit these billable targets. They then dissuade women from either coming back or essentially they don't progress because they are unable to meet these targets. It's targets this, billable hours that. But that doesn't define what a great lawyer is. And actually what you do is you, you get a brain drain. So actually in one way, you know, the, the in-house sector has really benefited Yes. Because these women lawyers have gone in house and they are getting the opportunities. Not enough. There's not enough women chief legal officer GC at that level. Yeah. But it, but you know that that is then the in house problem of you've got too many men making the decisions, and it's you know the same people bringing in their replicas. So they they want a guy that they can feel they can talk to. But, but you're losing this great talent. Like. Being a lawyer, it doesn't make a difference whether you're male or female, ultimately. Yeah. Like, the issues are the same, your response will be the same, except that you may have a different take on it because men tend to be a bit more hard and fast, to be honest. And actually, I've found that the women lawyers are much more considerate that I've worked with. And, and actually, there's some brilliant, brilliant lawyers that just don't get the opportunity because men don't give them the opportunity. We're way too behind where we should be. Absolutely. Well, then, Kevin, I know you've got a son and a daughter. You know, what, what sort of workplace would you like for them to be to work in, particularly in the legal sector? You know, say they wanted to do law. What would you like the workplace to look like for when they start? Actually, I've got a niece in the UK who's studying law and she'll be hopefully entering the profession really soon. And, and actually, my cousin went back and she's trained. I think she's doing her LPC now. Brilliant. So for them, I'm too too late in the curve to really push this forward as much as I want from where I want it to be. But I don't want them to have to battle 
to get where they want to be. I don't want them to feel they have to work harder than their male counterparts just to be at the same level, to, to tread water. It's not just about equality, it's about equity. Also, I, I want them to be able to, on merit, rise up the ranks. And if they're good enough, they will. I want them to have the same crack of chances. Like, I want them to to um, be invited to the client dinners. Oh, because they don't drink, so what? That's okay. You know, not to be excluded from the conversation because you feel that they may not get it or may not be part of it. I just want them not to have us to work harder just to tread water. Absolutely. Or, yeah. or the client dinners could be an afternoon tea where people yes. can, drink, can drink tea <laughs> or coffee. You know, it doesn't have to be boozy or non-alcoholic cocktails. Um, Kevin, I wonder, you know, you, you've got a big responsibility uh, uh, in the company you work for, a really interesting job. You've got a family life as well. We know looking at the well-being statistics provided by Law Care and other charities, the burnout rate is high in law. So I wonder, what do you do for well-being? I've often said, you know, I'm sure we all drink too much or, you know, don't exercise as much. But, you know, COVID has been an interesting point, hasn't it? So what do you do for your own wellness uh, outside of the working hours? Okay, so uh, going to your point of drinking too much, uh, I think in my... <laughs> I'm not judging, I'm not judging. No, no, no. In the earlier days, that was the stress relief, which, you know, when you actually think about it, compounded the stress because you're getting less hours sleep, particularly when you're in private practice with the machoism of, I've worked 70 hours straight, I haven't gone to sleep, I've been at the office for these many hours, now I'm going to go straight out on the town, be one of the lads. It was just, a, it was a bit of a joke, really. But now it in the last certainly in the last year i started running and i've actually signed up for the new york marathon i'm going to run on be behalf of uh, autism speaks wow so that's in november assuming that still goes ahead with covid so i'm in training for that yeah uh, i did my first half marathon which actually got cancelled but i did it i just ran it myself anyway Fantastic. Um, so running i get up early i write a journal a gratitude journal every day yeah. as well as i meditate and it can vary from five minutes a day to 20 minutes a day, depending on my schedule, my time. But I make sure I sort of started it beginning of 2019. And I could never get like a length of period of time without stop. But now today was day 98 in a row. I'd set my target 60 days in a row uh, at the beginning of the year. That was my goal for this year. So I smashed that. So I was like, now let's see if the new target's 120 days in a row. I'm going to see if I can get it to, to at least the end of the year of every single day just a couple of minutes even if it's just a couple of minutes fantastic now because of covid19 you've not been able to be jetting all over asia and some of the uh, glamorous places for work but i wonder what impact that's had on your home life and your family life uh, you know are you seeing the family a bit more so perhaps you've got more balance can you share some of the things you've been doing and how that's been <laughs> yeah yeah so well, one, being in the States and in Michigan, I'm fortunate to live in a house which has lots of space. And and the fact that uh, when we moved in here, I straight away went into a room, put all my boxes in there and had it painted the colours I want from my office. So then <laughs> I, I, slowly my wife has actually helped me kit it out as a proper office. So I'm, I'm very fortunate to that. Actually, at the beginning of COVID, it was really crazy work-wise. You know, you're dealing with what's going to happen, these stay-at-home orders, in the, you know, particularly for North America, and I'm responsible for North America and Asia. So you're dealing with something which has already happened in Asia but still going on and something that's completely new in North America. And with North America, every state has different laws. You've got these federal laws as well, and it's trying to get on top of and advise the business. What can we do? What should we be doing? Furloughs, how should, you know, and then trying to get the, we need to do the right thing for our people. You know, we're a public company. These things get out there type of advice. Um, so I actually found I saw my family less. And the, the start of the day and the end of the day completely blurred. It, you know, I'm starting the calls at 6 a.m. You're going all the way through. You forget, completely forget time. And then everybody's just phoning you up and you're just constantly on. But I guess from about May, it's, I'd say, marginalized and, and now I'm at the point where it's like certain yeah. days it's I'm going to finish today at four o'clock I'm going to go and it's beautiful weather I'm going to go and play with my son in the paddling pool yeah. but we have a tradition in our house on a Friday 
because my son loves coming in. He's three years old. He loves to come in my office, pretend he's daddy on the computer, but actually just ends up destroying my office. So what we've done is we've said every Friday at 5.30, we have what we call Friday happy hour and a boat, Friday bow tie day for my son. 4.30, I hear them go upstairs and they're getting ready. And then my son knocks on the door at 5.30 and he's in his shorts, but with a shirt and a little bow tie on. I'll go out, my wife will have a bottle of wine and we'll sit in my office and it's just like a nice way to end the week. <laughs> yeah, that's so cute. We need some pictures of him doing it. Uh, or, you know, you could cover his face so we don't have to see, you know, a child on there. But yeah, you'll need to send a picture. We'll, we'll Twitter it. Maybe you can have a, a book over his face. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, actually, then, we'll get him, I'll get him to hold up this. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Talking more. And actually, you know, if you want to find out more about Kevin and his motivations, he's on page 232 of my book, Talking Law. All the profits are to five charities, including Access to Justice Foundation. So, Kevin, before we finish, really, you've told us about the books that have really had the most impact on you. So I wonder if you've ever had a favourite fictional lawyer. You mentioned L.A. Law before. And you have got a slight look of Blair Underwood about you. If, uh, uh, I'm trying sure. not to show my age. You know, I'll, I'll pretend I'm, I'm more familiar with suits, but I know L.A. Law well. It's good. <laughs> you know, if you've got a, a, a favourite fictional lawyer. Yeah, Rumpole. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Do you know what? Uh... And actually, when you think about it, he's probably one of the most un PC lawyers, very unattuned with diversity and inclusion. But it's just his, he just doesn't care <laughs> sort of attitude. He's very much, this is who I am. Now, you either like me or you don't. And yeah. She, who uh, you can't say her name, like I can't remember the name, how he refers to his wife, but you never know her name. <laughs> yes, that's uh, true. Not she who must be obeyed, but I'm just, I'll have to look at the, some of the jobs. Yeah, she who must be obeyed. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So actually, my father in law is now getting into it because my wife told him, oh, you need to listen to, I think he's listened, he might be listening to them on Audible. So he's listening to that. But John Mortimer, I mean, he was a lawyer as well yeah. um, himself, but what a fantastic writer. Actually, I've been looking for to try and get some early edition copies of those books. And I'm trying to find, you know, a search where they're affordable as well, because they are brilliant books. And I'd love my yeah. children to read them one day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, look, watch this space. I mean, I'm sure there's a, there's a book dealer somewhere along the way who will contact me. What, what advice would you give? Have you got some advice, tips, perhaps maybe one or two or three um, for people who are in the law, established practitioners, um, or maybe they're entering the law. Well, I often say that law is like a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. And there are retention issues still in our profession and other issues. But I just wondered if you had any kind of advice or guidance for those perhaps who are established in the law, or even, as I said, those who are starting in their careers about remaining in the law and progressing in the law. Yeah, I think... Um... This really has hit home for me in the last year or so, but it's to be true to yourself. Uh, remember why you became a lawyer. And it's really easy to get hyped up in, particularly as you you, you develop and you, you progress through either law firms or even in-house and through the ranks and you become more senior, you also get more financially better off, is not to lose sight. I certainly did. I, I, I don't think in the, certainly for a few years, I, I got lost in ego of being a lawyer, I'm a lawyer, da, da, da. and actually that's a joke. I'm just a person like everybody else. It's remember why you became a lawyer and in your decision making and in your advice you give, make sure that comes through because that's your personal brand as well. That's, that's who you are. And um, it's about being yourself and people gravitate towards that. People come towards people who truly are themselves. And, and being a lawyer, you need people to follow you. You need people to take your advice because you're not, you know, you're not doing it for a joke or fun. Like it's genuinely, this is good advice. So if you're a good skilled lawyer, you want people to follow your advice, be true to yourself so that they actually do follow it. You don't want to be that, oh, well, we have a lawyer, but he's a token. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic advice. So we really look forward to your podcast. When does it start? And I'm sure it'll be on Spotify and iTunes and all the usual places. But what's it called and when can we expect to hear it? Okay. Uh, it's called Cocktail Leadership. It's my ideas around human leadership, purpose and, and cocktails, because actually leadership ultimately is a bit of a mix. Not every cocktail is good, as we know. You can make no. two, of the, two, two, two cocktails 
too old fashions or too too mojitos yeah too mojitos and they may taste very differently so it comes out on the 15th of july i hope if i can get myself and everybody else in gear <laughs> uh, but I, I honestly have some amazing guests and ultimately it's, it's a passion project for me it's all about sharing some ideas i hope people will think about those ideas and maybe it will inspire people to go do you know what i'm going to try this out what have i got to lose and and by trying it out you may impact other people who, who benefit from that leadership style and, and the purposes coming out of that Fantastic. Kevin, with Ain, it's been a, a, a pleasure having you uh, on Talking Law podcast. It's been great to interview you. Um, thank you very much for Talking Law with me. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Sally. A big thanks to Kevin with Ain for taking time to talk to me. Do watch out for his podcast, Cocktail Leadership. Thank you again for listening to Talking Law with me, Sally Penny. Do connect with me on Twitter at SallyPenny1. We'd love it if more people heard our podcast. So if you could spare just a couple of minutes to leave us a review, that will help people find us. Until the next episode, do check out the latest Women in the Law UK book. It's a look at how far the profession has come in the last hundred years, featuring career and well-being advice from women and men. It's available now on Amazon. To search for Talking Law by Sally Penny. And don't forget to visit us at womeninthelawuk.com for all the latest news about our organization. We look forward to connecting with you. Talking Law was produced by Sam Walker and is a What Goes On Media production. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.